I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God is good. And all the time. Let's try that again. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. When God, Christ, actually came down on that mountain to meet with Moses, he described himself as abundant in goodness and truth. Let me tell my dear sister how much I admired how calm and cool you were when people were trying to get the mic. God bless you. May you always possess that calmness and that coolness. I really sat there and I couldn't believe how calm and how cool you were. Most people would have fallen apart, but she just kept going right on. And so God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I really mean that sincerely. God is good and all the time. What time does the sun set? So we have some time. Who has to rush off to work? Nobody. All right. What's your favorite Bible verse? Nobody on this side has a Bible verse you like. Nobody? Oh, yes, sister. Jesus wept. Jesus Where's that found? <laughs> John eleven thirty five. 35. Now, why is that your favorite verse? Or oh, short. Easy to memorize. Okay, all right. Somebody else, what's your favorite Bible? Yes, Barbara. Uh huh. Psalm 121. Mm hmm. To the Lord, yes, the hills. Yes, yes. Beautiful. I love it so much. I have recited that more than any other Bible passage. Yes, my dear sister. Isaiah 26 3, which says, Whose mind is. Yes, yes. What kind of peace? Perfect peace. Let me tell you something. I'll come to you, my good brother. No matter what happens in this world, and things are getting worse you can be at peace if your mind is stayed upon God. Mm -hmm. Remember the disciples on the boat in the lake? What was going on? There was a storm. What was their response? They were panicking. What was Christ doing? Sleeping. He slept trusting his Father. That's why when they disturbed him, he said, why are you so fearful? How can you ask a man that question in a storm? Why are you fearful? But the child of God must come to the place where he or she is calm when everyone else is pulling their hair out. That in itself is a witness. Mm -hmm. To be calm in trouble is a witness. While the world panics, we must be calm because we know who has our back. Can you with, are you with me? All right. Yes, my good brother. Isaiah 65, which says, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful verse. Beautiful verse, yes. Yes, my brother. Mm -hmm. To them that? To them that love the Lord, yes. To them who are called according to his purpose. And what is this purpose? That we may be found without blame in Jesus Christ. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. Yes, my dear sister. Psalm 27, 4 says what? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. How long? All the days of my life. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, my brother. Verse 10, which says what? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Be not dismayed. Yes. Go on. Strengthen the, uh-huh. 
Mm -hmm. The right hand of my righteousness, yes. Now, notice the verse says, Fear not, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. God must be your personal God. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, Daniel 6, Darius came to the mouth of the den. He said, O Daniel, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee? Is your God. He didn't say our God. The Persian God is your God. In Daniel 3, the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace are about to be put in the fiery furnace. Um, Dan, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Nebuchadnezzar said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. You have to know that God is your God, yeah. my God. Somebody else, your favorite verse, yes. John 3, for God so, uh-huh, yes, that whosoever, mm-hmm, yes, that's the most popular verse in the entire world. Yes, my sister. Uh-huh. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper. None. Mm -hmm. Yes, my sister. John, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him. Now, which means we as a people should not specialize in condemning people. Listen to Jesus. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. That's the Bible. But that the world through him might be saved. We should not be known for condemning, but for encouraging. Not that we agree with sin. No, we must hate sin, but try as Jesus did to love the sinner. Somebody else. Yes, my dear sister. First Peter 5, 7 says what? How many? Where? Yeah, why? Yes, he cares for you. Yes, my lovely sister. Okay. Be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 46, verse 10, I believe you find that there. Be still and know that I am God. Yes. Yes, my sister. With how much of your heart? All. 99% won't work. With all thine heart. Go on. Lean not. Mm -hmm. In how many ways? All. Mm -hmm. This is comprehensive coverage. Uh huh. Now, what does the wreck your paths mean? How many times have you said, What does God want me to do? What's God's will for me? That's directing your path. There's a condition in all thy ways. Let God control how you eat, let Him control how you dress, let Him control your romantic life. Somebody say amen quickly. Amen. Let Him control. <laughs> <laughs> and he shall direct, how many? Thy paths, all of them. God is a specialist at guiding, but he has conditions. Somebody else, your favorite verse. Yes, sister. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. That's Psalm 77, verse 13, I believe it is. Yes. All right. Yes, my cameraman. Uh-huh. And that's found where? In Matthew 6, 33. Matthew what? 6, All right, very good, yes. Let us hear the yes, uh huh. Fear God. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Whole, and that's found where? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Mm hmm, very good. Some, yes. Psalm Psalm what? Uh huh, uh huh. Struck thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. The eye of God is the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of God is right here. Amen. Here again, we have assurance that God desires to guide us. Somebody else? Yes, my good brother. Psalm 91. Yes. Secret. Mm -hmm. Shall abide under the shadow almighty. I will save the Lord. He's my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. And from the noise and pestilence, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. My mother's favorite psalm. God rest her. Favorite psalm. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That Bible was falling apart slightly. 
My favorite verse is Genesis 1 1. What does that say? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, we have time. God, we have someone. Created, we have an action. The heaven, we have space. And the earth, we have matter. We, it's, it's, uh, it also tells us there are two ways to exist. You either exist as God, or you exist as a part of creation. There's no other way to exist. Either as God, or as creation. And so I love very much Genesis 1.1. There's a reason why it is the first verse of the Bible, because all Scripture is given how? By inspiration. The Spirit deliberately led Moses to make that the very first verse, which means God is introduced not as a Savior, but as a Creator. One day in the new world, when all sin is done away, we, He shall still be Creator. He shall cease to be Savior. Right now in heaven, he's what? Christ is functioning as a high priest. When he takes that um, censer and casts it into the earth, Revelation 8 verse 5, his intercession ceases, and he comes back as what? A conquering king, no longer as a priest. But he will always be creator. Always. That's why the Bible says, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. If there had been no sin, there would have been no need for Savior, but there will always be need for a creator, not simply to create, but to maintain. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And he, from that point on, has preserved heaven and earth. And one day, he will make a new heaven and a new earth. Tell me why. Why will this one be destroyed? Because of sin. Now allow me to, let me pray. Father, this is not my message, but it's just coming to me. Guide my mind, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Anything touched by sin cannot exist forever. It has to come to an end if it's touched by sin. And for us to live forever, sin must be removed from us. It must be removed because if it is touched by sin, it cannot. Go to Hebrews chapter 1 quickly. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Let's read from verse 8 to verse 12 of Hebrews 1. And my Bible version, which I prefer, is the King James, but I use others when I study. But in public and in memorization and recitation, I use the King James Version. Do you have Hebrews 1? Let's read from verse 8. Now, this is God the Father speaking to the Son. It's a very interesting chapter of the Bible. We're listening to God speaking to the Son, and the Son never responds, but He's listening to the Father. Now, verse 8 says what? But of the Son, he, unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. In other words, God is making a contrast between Christ and angels. Who maketh the angel spirits and his minister a flaming fire. Verse 7. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God. What does the Father call Jesus? He calls him God. There are some people who argue whether Jesus is fully God when the Father himself calls him God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now the Father says the Son has a throne. The throne has existed for how long? Forever. If the Son has a throne, the Son also has a, a kingdom. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there are two kingdoms, but the same kingdom... Jesus shares the throne with his Father. And the voice of Christ for the angels carries the same authority as the voice of the Father. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Here we're told very clearly the Father tells us Christ has a kingdom. Look at verse 
Skip to 11. Well, let's look at 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Then what should I love? What should I hate? Yes. That's the father describing his son. You have loved righteousness, hated iniquity. Let's skip to verse 10. Read very carefully. What does that say? And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth. Now, do you see the word beginning? Do you see the word earth? Do you see the word heaven? Now listen to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, keep your eye on Hebrews 1.10. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Are you with me? Keep your eye on Hebrews 1.10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, we know from verse 8, he's also called God. Am I going too fast? In verse 8 of Hebrews 1, he's called God. If you see that, say amen. amen. So the person called Lord is also God. He's the Lord God. And the Father says, thou, Lord, in the beginning, and we have beginning in Genesis 1. We have God and Lord in Hebrews 1, 8, and 10. We have God in Genesis 1. Hebrews, 8, Hebrews 1, 10 has laid the foundation of the earth. Genesis 1, he created the earth. The heavens are the works of thy hands. He made the heavens. Then, when you read Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who's the principal creator? Jesus. Jesus. Notice a key word I use, who's the? Because all through involved, but the central figure of creation is Christ. And the Father says, you created heaven and earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Now, I said that anything touched by sin has to cease. Look at verse 11. They shall, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as the third. Now, what is he trying to say? What's the Father saying about the heaven and the earth? They'll pass away. He says, and like a vesture, they shall wax old. In other words, the world and the heavens, touched by sin, they are gradually deteriorating. I don't care how much technology we have. This world, this heaven as we know it, they are deteriorating. Why? Because of sin. Because technology does not reverse sin. Are you following me? Now, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. Finish verse 12. But thou art the same. And thy years, come on, shall not fail. What is the father saying about the son? He's eternal. Mm -hmm. He's eternal. Thy years shall not fail. God is, Christ is eternal. Has always been there. Came down in human form. Lived a perfect life. Voluntarily gave up his life. Raised himself from the dead. Went back to heaven, and that's where he is now. Still clothed in human form, by the way. This time glorified humanity, which we will have when we are resurrected from the dead. Or for those of us who are translated, we'll have that same body that Christ has now. He has always been there. We will live forever by his power. What do I mean by his power? Go to Second Peter chapter 3. I want you to get a different view of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. I hope you know that. It's all about Jesus. Mr. Cameraman, forgive me for moving around. I'll try to stay one place. I didn't realize I was making your life difficult back there. You're suffering quietly. All right. What book did I say? What chapter? Let's read from verse 5, but let me pray again. Fathers, I continue. Instruct me as to what to tell your beloved people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For this they willingly are ignorant of. By the way, let me give you the, the title for the message, even though I've not yet gotten to the message. It is, the point is a person. What did I say? The point is a person. Has someone ever asked you, what's the point? Are you? Well, your answer is, the point is a person. 
What's the point of salvation? It's a person. All right. 2 Peter chapter 3 from verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of. Stop. Have you ever heard someone say, don't tell me? You're going to Bible study or you're trying to invite someone to church, don't tell me. No, that does not work with God. You see, for God, ignorance means I did not know and I had no way of knowing. Are you with me? I did not know, I had no way of knowing. You cannot tell God, well, I told him, don't tell me. That's not ignorance in God's eyes. That's presumption. That's boldness. That's sticking your fist under God's nose. For this they willingly are ignorant of, now read with me, that by the, come on, look at 2 Peter 3, 5, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So we have heaven and earth by the word. If that's clear, say amen. amen. Skip to verse 7 now. You read nice and loud, I will listen to you. But the heavens and the... Uh-huh. By the same word are what? Kept. Ah. What does kept in store mean? Maintained, preserved, reserved. Mm -hmm. By the same word. Which means the word that creates is the word that meant the same word the same word which means the level of excellence that was seen in creation must be seen in maintaining creation you can't have maintenance at this level and creation at this level because it is the same word. Let me ask you this. Are we part of creation, yes or no? Yes. yes. When God originally made Adam and Eve, give me one word to describe them, they were? One word. Sinless. Sinless. How does God want to preserve us? Sinless. Sinless. By the same word. I'm talking to myself. You're sleeping with your eyes open. <laughs> Listen to me again. If any man be in Christ, come on, tell me. New creation. What brings about the creation? Mm -hmm. In Genesis 1-3, tell me how the light was made. And God? And God said the word. Psalm 33 verse 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. By the word. Hebrews 11 verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I'm trying to get it into your heads. It's the word that creates. But it's the word that sustains. Now the word that creates is the divine word. The word that sustains is not an angelic word. It is still, come on, the divine word. Which means God's original plan was creation was created perfect and was to continue how? Perfect. Sin entered. Are you following me? And brought down the quality of God's creation. Christ came to take that creation back to the original level of perfection. both humanity and the natural world. That's why the world has to be remade, the heavens have to be remade, and people have to be remade. And it's all done by the Word. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of His mouth. Ellen White tells us, He who receives the Word of God is receiving the very life and character of God. In Education, page 126, paragraph 4, Ellen White writes, The creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts power. It begets life. She's saying... The Word of God gives life. 
which, has, which means the Word of God has life. The Word of God is life. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are, they are spirit and they are life. Mm -hmm. When you receive God's word, you receive the life of God. But you can't receive the word modified, the word editorialized. You receive the word as it is given. Don't add, don't take away. The seventh day is the Sabbath, case closed. Amen. You receive that, you receive life. Amen. Thou shalt not kill, you receive that, you receive life. Thou shalt not commit adultery, you receive that, you receive life. Thou shalt not bear false witness, you receive that, you receive life. What life? The very life of God. It's in His Word. The Bible tells us in James 1, verse 18, to see how life comes by the word. Go to James chapter 1. Let's read verse 18. James 1, reading verse 18. James was the half-brother of Jesus. Or step-brother, if you want to say that. There was another brother of Christ who wrote a book of the Bible. What was his name? Jude, Jude yes, brother Jude, right next to Revelation. Do you have James 1, 18? If you have my version, read with me. What does that say? Okay, stop again. Read clearly. What does that say? Of his, of his own will begat he us. How? With the word of truth. Stop. What does begat mean? To give birth to. That's why it's called born again. Of his own will begat he us. How? With the word of truth. Now, go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's read verse 23. 1 Peter 2, verse 23, the point is a person. It's raining outside. We thank God for a church that does not leak. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, who has that? Read for us. What does that say? First Peter 2, 23. 1 Peter 2, 23. sorry, 1 23. My eternal mistake. 1 23. Being born again, mm -hmm. not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever now. Read that again slowly. Being? Stop. What is, give me another word for born again. Give me another word for born again. If you're born again, Christian, you have experienced what? Conversion. Then what's the power that brings about conversion? The word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And what's the incorruptible seed? The Word of God, which liveth. The Word does what? It lives. It lives. For how long? Because the Word of God has the very life of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This, and I'm stressing that because we have come to a time in Earth's history and we're coming closer and closer to what we know to be the time of trouble when we will have to stand squarely without any hesitation on thus saith the Lord. Even though all the signs tell us something else seems to be about to happen, we must stand on, but the Bible said if God said, stand right here, and if the sharks come, they'll go right by you. And you stand right here, you see the sharks coming with teeth. You have to say, wait a minute, now the shark is two feet away, and you're standing here. The word says, you stay where you are, and he'll pass you by. You've got to stand where you are, on thus saith the Lord. Because no shark can overcome a child of God who stands on thus. So God said, stand right here. So God told the Israelites as they looked at the walls of Jericho, Jericho was the most powerful city of the ancient world, most powerful city, heavily defended, thick walls. People lived on the walls. 
Remember Rahab? She lived on the wall. God told them, just walk around the city. Walk around the city. We need some siege engines to knock down. Walk around the city. <laughs> Once a day, then seven times on Sabbath, blow your horn and shout my name. That's all. And that's what they did. What happened to the walls? They came down. What God tells us to do does not have to make sense. All we have to establish is, did God say that? And if God said it, it does not have to make sense because God is divine and I'm human. Divine truth sometimes makes no sense. Whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, do what? That makes no sense. <laughs> not in this life. But Jesus says, that's what you do. This, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Amen. Let me talk about the power of the word of God. Amen. Let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That Bible you're holding, I hope you realize you have gold, dynamite, diamonds, treasure, that Bible. Life, eternal life. Do you have, uh, what book did I say? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll read a verse you know very well. You can say it without looking. Verse 16. Let's see if we can say it without looking. Everybody look up. No cheating you in church. Are you ready? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, come on, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Let's look at three words. For the Lord himself, nobody else, you can't confuse, this is Christ, shall descend from heaven with a shout, come on, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. Now, are those three different things? No, not. They're all referring to what? Doing what? Speaking loudly. That's all. He speaks loudly. Now the verse ends by saying what? The day in Christ. Now what do you think Christ will shout and say? Arise, ye righteous dead. Now, go to John 11. John 11. What's John 11 well known for? Come on. The raising of Lazarus from the dead. Okay. Did we just hear Christ with a loud voice in 1 Thessalonians 4.16? All right. Let's go to John 11.43. I hope you realize rain is the result of sin. You know that. You didn't know that. You know that. There was no rain before sin. Rain began with a flood when Christ destroyed this earth. Eh, that's another time. Okay, you look confused. All right. Let's go to John 11.43. Do you have that? Read with me, and when he thus had spoken, he did what? He cried with a loud voice, stop. The Lord shall descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, loud voice. This is the same voice now we're hearing at the tomb of Lazarus. He cried with a what? What did he say? Lazarus, come forth. By the way, a loud voice is a... You read Revelation, loud voice. There's something about a loud voice that has power that a soft voice does not actually have the same thing. A loud voice. Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? Read verse 44. Dead. Came forth, bound hand and foot with the grave. Now, he that was dead, did what? Came forth. Why did he come forth? Did Jesus touch him, yes or no? No. Was Christ in the grave or in the cave? No. Christ was outside. Lazarus was inside. And he began to decompose. That's why Martha said, Lord, by this time, he's thinking. Jesus just spoke. Now, I want you to imagine this. He just spoke. And a dead man 
came up. Now, this same Jesus will come back. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, with a shout. Because now he's raising a lot of people. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, how does verse 16 end? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. The word. Now we know, read verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, which means when Christ comes, he does not touch the earth. Are you with me? The second time he comes, he doesn't touch the earth. We don't know how far in the heavens he stays, but he does not touch down. But he comes, and from some distance in the heavens, he shouts. The dead rise. They, they come forth changed. We're changed in the moment, and then we all rise. The dead who are risen first, and we're behind them. To meet the Lord in the air, he doesn't come down. So he comes nowhere close to the earth. His voice does the work. Now go to Matthew 8. Matthew 8. Let's read from verse 5. Matthew 8, reading from verse 5. When you found that, say amen. amen. Read with me if you have my version. What does that say? Amen. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion doing what? Be seizing him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy and grievously tormented. Now, listen to what Jesus... Now, the, the, the centurion said, my servant is at home. He's not right here. Are you with me? He's at home. Jesus said, I will come. I need him. Let's travel to your home. The centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof. But speak the word only. Jesus says in heaven, I don't need to touch down on the earth. I'll just speak the word. When the centurion said that, Jesus marveled and said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in all Israel. And the guy was healed. Jesus clearly spoke the word. The Bible says, man shall not live, how? By bread alone, but by every word. Uh-huh. Ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Mm-hmm. Not from the mouth of Benny Hinn or T.D. Jakes or Randy Skeet. From the mouth of God. You see, it's necessary to say that because Adam and Eve, our parents, they were confronted with two voices. One voice said, thou shalt surely die. The other voice said, you shall not surely die. Now, we're to live by every word. This, this applied to Adam and Eve. They did not live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Because out of the mouth of God came these words, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt, come on, tell me, surely die. That proceeded from the mouth of God. Sunday is the Sabbath did not proceed from the mouth of God. It proceeded from the mouth of Constantine. And we ought to obey God, come on, rather than Constantine. <laughs> or the Pope. There are always two voices. What God said and what somebody else says, regardless of who that somebody else is. It represents the devil. Anything opposed to thus saith the Lord originates with Satan. But he has agents that he uses. The first agent he used on earth was the snake. The second agent he used was Eve. By the way, never be used by the devil to damage someone spiritually. Thus saith the Lord. If Adam and Eve had lived by thus saith the Lord, we would not be in this position today. We have to learn to live by every word. Why is it that there's in heaven now, there's harmony? Let's go to Psalm 103. 
And Satan wanted to disrupt that harmony, and he succeeded to some degree. He really did. Psalm 103. That's another beautiful psalm, by the way. Let's read verse 30, not 30, sorry, verse 20, carefully of Psalm 103. Do you have that? Not yet. I'll wait for some of you to find it. Psalm 103, verse 20. When you found it, say amen. amen. Read with me. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Now, there are two things, there are two pairs of words in that verse. Remember this morning we had two pairs of words in Psalm 147, verse 19. Now let's go to, let's look at that Psalm 103, verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength, that do what? His commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. What goes along with word? Commandments. What goes along with do? Hark, very good. Somebody back there is very bright. Do and hearken are the same thing. Commandments and word are the same thing. Go to Psalm 147. Psalm 147, read verse 15 very carefully, microscopically. Read with me now. He sendeth forth his. Uh huh. Read it again. He sendeth forth his commandment upon earth. His word runneth now. Commandment and word in that verse are the same thing. And I'm trying to build to a point. Go to John 14. John 14, let's read verse 15 of John 14. This is a verse you all know very well. You can say it without looking. Do you have that? Say it with me. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Keep my what? Commandments. Go to verse 21. Read with me. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. So we have commandments again. Now go to verse 23. If a man, uh-huh, he will. Wait a minute now. If a man love me, he will keep my? What did Jesus mean by words? Commandments. Go to First John chapter 2. First John 2. Let's read verse 3. You have that? Not yet. First John chapter 2. We read from verse 3. Read with me. And hereby we do know that we know him what? If we keep his commandments. Now, you see the word commandments? Nice and long word. Read verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a, and the truth is not. Read verse 5. But whoso keepeth his, wait a minute, what does that word there mean? Commandment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in the Bible, you see commandment and word close to each other because they both, some, they both function the same way. Sometimes commandments refer to words, or words refer to com Now, listen carefully to Jesus. Man shall not live by bread alone. Finish it for me. Say it again. But by every? But by every commandment. Mm -hmm. Now, listen to Ellen White. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4A, page 150, paragraph 1. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4A, page 150, paragraph 1. Christ refers to his Father's law. 
The words of Sinai are the conditions of life. What she's saying, when Christ said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, Christ was referring to the Ten Commandments. Well, that makes a lot of sense, because the commandments are the whole. The favorite verse of my brother on the camera, I believe. No, my brother right here. What's the commandments? They're the whole duty of man. So Christ is saying, that's how you live. Listen to me. When Christ comes a second time, we live in a brand new world, no sin. Will there be a Bible, yes or no? Don't be hesitant. Speak with confidence even when you're wrong. Now, will there be a Bible? No. Will there still be the law? Yes. Mm -hmm. Which means, if you were to take the Bible and condense it, are you with me? You know what you'd have? The Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. The entire Bible shows us how to live in harmony with the Ten Commandments. That's God's will for us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, including the fourth commandment, that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I'm trying to elevate the word. Let me tell you something just to think about. Are you with me? Let me pray first. Father, as I continue, let your spirit really tell me how to say it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. How did God make Adam and Eve? What did he do? Okay, he used the dust, yes. How did he make the trees? He spoke, and what happened? Trees came. How did he make angels? He spoke. The Bible tells us, let's see how he made angels. Go to Psalm 148. I don't want you to think these are my words. Psalm 148. We read 1, 2, and 5. That, again, is a beautiful psalm. Oh, beautiful psalm, 148. Psalm 148, verses 1, 2, and 5. It's ten minutes after five. The sun is not setting anytime soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have Psalm 148? Verse 5, read with me. What does it say? Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Stop at verse 2. All his angels, all his hosts. Now go to verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, come on, and they were created. Now listen, Elvi said, use your imagination when reading the Bible. You're reading about the crucifixion? Take your mind back to that cross. See the blood. See the soldiers. Use your imagination. Now, there was a time when it was just Father, Son, Holy Ghost, nobody else. God decided we'll make angels. How do you think he did that? What did he say? What did he say? Let there be angels. Mm -hmm. Why do you look so confused? Let there be angels. <laughs> and there were angels. Because the Word of God creates. Amen. Now, let's go to Genesis 1. We were reviewing what did God create, how. The trees, He spoke. And the trees came. Look at verse 24 of Genesis 1. Read that for us. And God said... Let the earth bring forth the living creature after its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it. God just spoke, and the animals came. Living things by the word of God. Go to Genesis 2. Read verse 19. Do you have Genesis 2, 19? And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air. But we know from verse 24, chapter 1, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. And they came from the same dirt and the dust. Living creatures. All right. Look at verse 11. Come on, read. And God said, 
Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed. Verse 12 says, and the earth brought forth grass. How? How? By the, don't hesitate. How? By the word. How was the light made? Verse 3 to verse 5. And God said, let there be light. And there was light by the word. And so the Bible properly says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Look at verse 20. Come on, read for me. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Yes, the word made the fish and the birds and the trees, land animals, the light, separated dry land from water. Now go to verse 26. Before you do that, let's look at the first few words of every day of creation. Read verse 3. And God said, let there be. Stop. Do you see let there be? Go to verse 6. And God said, let there be. Uh-huh, let again. Go to verse 9. So we have let something happen. Go to verse 11. Let. So we have some. We have let, let this, let, let, let. Look at verse 14. Let there be lights. Mm-hmm. Look at verse 20. Mm-hmm. Look at verse 24. Let, so let this happen, let that happen, let that happen. All creation so far was done how? By the word of God. Now read verse 26. Do you see let? No. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, here's what I want you to think about. How then did God make Adam and Eve? All right, this one has given you a migraine. Let me help you out. How did God make the light? Tell me. He spoke. How did he make the, the, the water? How did he make the grass? How did he make the sun, moon, and stars? How did he make the fish and the birds? How did he make the land animals? How did he make Adam and Eve? Mm-hmm. <laughs> See, <laughs> what's that? Yeah, yeah, he, but... Read verse 19 of verse chapter 2. Let's put scripture upon scripture. Read verse 19 of chapter 2. What does that say? Out of the ground the Lord God formed. Mm -hmm. But verse, chap verse 1 tells us how we did that forming. He just spoke. Read verse 9 of chapter 2. And out of the ground the Lord God Made the Lord God to grow, every tree that's pleasant to the side. He made it to grow, he formed them, but we know he spoke in Genesis 1, verse 11 and verse 12. Well, how did he make Adam and Eve? What did he do? How did he make angels? He spoke. I know what, something is sticking right there in your throat, you can't say it. Here's what you want to say. He stooped down, hmm? scooped up dirt. That's what you want to say. And that's what you want to say. But you have no Bible proof of that. Let me ask you this. Are you with me? I can see some of you really struggling, even though you're smiling, you struggle. <laughs> huh? Okay, look at two verses. Read it for us. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, yes, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. Okay. Now, let's go to Genesis 7 then, if you want to use Genesis 2. Let's go to Genesis 7. My brother is saying, well, God must have formed him with his hands because he breathed into his nostrils. Okay. Genesis 7, the chapter of the flood. Let's read from verse 20. This is how high the flood rose over the mountains. Verse 20 says what? Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Every mountain was covered by the flood. Verse 21. And all flesh died, come on, that moved upon the earth. Stop. Now, Moses is about to give the list of what he means by all flesh died. He wants us to understand what that means. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth. Now, here's the list. Give it to me, both of... 
Aha, anav. Aha. Aha. Aha, and? And every man. That's all flesh. And every man. Now, read the next verse. All in whose nostrils, uh uh-huh, was the breath of life. Stop. (laughs) Are you with me, my brother? (laughs) The breath of life in a cow was the breath of life where? In Adam. Physically. You still look as though I need medication. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. <laughs> Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes 3. I know you love God's word. You'll believe the word. You don't have to believe me. Ecclesiastes 3. Do you have that? Nobody answered the preacher. I'm getting accustomed to this culture of silence. Do you have Ecclesiastes 3? Let's read verse 19. You must read honestly. Don't read anything into the Bible. Read something out of it. Are you ready? For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth be. Stop. What does that mean to you? Put it in English. We all die. <laughs> Whatever happens to people happens to animals. That's all it says. Now, keep reading. Even one thing befalleth them. Keep going. As the one dieth, so dieth. In other words, they die the same way. That gives us a clue as to how they were made. They die the same way. Keep reading. Come on. Yea, they have all one breath. Physically, physiologically, The oxygen you need, a cow needs. And you remove oxygen from a cow, it dies. Remove it from a human being, he or she dies. They have all one breath. Keep reading. Keep reading. Say that again. Say it clearly. All go unto one place. Keep reading. All are of the dust. Go on. All turn to dust again. Who is all? People and animals. Keep reading. So that a man no have, have no preeminence over a beast. And verse 21 says, who can say the spirit of a man goeth upward, the spirit of a beast goeth downward? No, no, they all go to the same place. The Bible says they have all one breath. Now, if the animals have the same breath, and you say God literally breathed into Adam's nostrils, what do you have to say about the cow? Mm Mm-hmm but we don't say that. (laughs) Are you with me? We don't say that. He only breathed Adam's nostrils. How did the cows get life? They have the same breath in their nostrils as a human being. Let us go back to, without going there, you know it in your head, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. Now you tell me, who is the first person to follow Christ and to die. The first martyr, the first person to die for Christ is whom? Who? Stephen. Oh, come on, Stephen. (laughs) Abel. Abel. Do you read about Abel in Hebrews 11? By faith, Abel. Uh Uh-huh, Abel, Abel. The first one to die for Christ. He died for what is right. We're told in Hebrews 11, verse, uh, is it Hebrews? No, 1 John, verse 3, verse 12. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because Abel's work were righteous, and Cain were wicked. And that righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. He died because he ex- a, a, uh, lived the righteousness of Christ. Abel, now. Which means if anyone is dust right now, it's Brother Abel. Are you with me? From what did God make Adam and Eve? From the dust of the ground. 
E from a rib, but the rib was made from the dust of the ground. Okay. When Christ comes, where does he stay? In the heavens. Where is Abel? What's his condition? There. Now you tell me, how does Christ make Abel? You take a deep breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My sister said, I'm not believing that she takes it. <laughs> Come on. How? Abel is dirt. He is dust. Are you with me? How does God make a man out of that dust? Talk to me. He speaks. And Abel comes up. He speaks. Okay, <laughs> let's. Uh, <laughs> notice I said I give you something to think about. You see, what I'm trying to do is elevate the word. You see, you see, the Bible says the word that creates is the word that sustains. If this didn't create you, then what sustains you? Because man shall not live by bread alone. He has to live by what created him. When Christ stood aside the tomb of Lazarus, the sister said, Lord, by this time, come on. He's thinking. What does she mean by that? What's the fancy word for that? Decomposition. What is decomposition? Going back, come on, to dirt. It happens to people. It happens to dogs. So here's a man going back to dirt. Jesus stands outside the cave somewhere. What does he do? He speaks. Who was the one who spoke during the week of creation? It was Jesus, the same person. Why do you look at me so strangely? It was the same person. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came out of that cave. How then did God make Adam? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm enjoying the looks on your faces. I really am. <laughs> you look like you're in delightful pain. <laughs> But I just want you to think. I'm not giving a doctrine. I, you see, there are things we've believed for years. Because a, a lady got very angry with me once. I was at a church, and I was talking about this. And she said, what? You mean Jesus did form me from the dirt? I said. And she was getting angry with me because it's so sweet to see God on his knees. You know, like children making sandcastles on the beach. And he takes some dirt. And he forms, and so he doesn't need a word, you see, he just uses hands. And that was beautiful for her, and I was destroying that. So she didn't like me anymore. <laughs> but we have to consider, what does the Bible say? Ellen White writes, as the word of God, which bade the first man live, still gives life today. What is she saying? She's right somewhere, I don't recall that. She said, a personal God, through Christ, a personal God created man and endowed him with intelligence and power. That's what she writes. But the full quotation is, through Christ, the word, a personal God created man. Through Christ, the word, a personal God created man. Everything in creation was made by the Word of God. The Bible, go to Psalm 138, verse 2. See how highly God values His Word, and we ought to value it just as highly. Psalm 138, verse 2. Do you have that? Not yet. Your silence tells me, not yet. Huh? Psalm 138, verse 2. Ver yes, you're right, my good brother, you're right. You're on the ball. Do you have that? Read verse 2 of Psalm 138. What does that say? I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy, and for thy, for thou hast magnified thy word, come on, above all thy name. Now, that's how high God's word is to him. How high is it to us? Thou hast magnified thy word. Above all thy truth, thy, thy name. 
We know the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. God has magnified his word above all his name. The word of God. Jesus has as one of his names the word of God. Revelation 13, 19 verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. To lower the word of God is to lower Christ. To elevate the word is to elevate Christ. All of creation was done by the word of God. All of recreation will be done by the word of Christ. If you understand this, you understand the importance of the Bible. Because that which creates is that which sustains. I have to be sustained by the thing that made me, and that is, thus saith the Lord. Faith is simply accepting, thus saith the Lord. Even when the rest of the universe seems to offer different evidence. For instance, most of the Christian world observes Sunday. The Bible says the seventh day. So even though you're surrounded by intelligent people with degrees and PhDs and whatever else who keep Sunday, Bible scholars who graduated with doctoral degrees in theology who say Sunday is the Sabbath, you've got to say, but the Bible says the seventh day. I just have a GED, but the Bible says the seventh day. That's what the Bible says. Am I looking right? You put your glasses on. Yes. The seventh day. Uh, he, but I have two PhDs. You say, well, I respect that, but let me check again. He says the seventh day. And it also says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It also says, my covenant will I not change. It also says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. The word. You know, <laughs> how were we saved from sin? That's Christ, the word. Christ is the word. Mm -hmm. The living word is Christ. What protects angels in heaven? The living word. The living, listen to me. Well, that doesn't sound right, but okay. Where did sin begin? Where is it carried out now? What's the, the antidote for sin? The cross of Christ. For earth, come on. Come on. For earth... And heaven. Hey, it feels so much. It feels much better when the audience believes you. Go to Colossians one, please. Colossians one. Let's read something fascinating. Colossians one. We're talking about the word, and our title is "The Point Is a Person." Five thirty on the dot. You have Colossians 1. Read verse 20 for me. Having made peace with the blood of his. Uh huh. Come on. Listen carefully. Come on. By him to what? Reconcile. Uh huh. All things unto himself. Uh huh. Go on. Both. Read verse 20. Whether they be things, they be things where? Uh-huh. Oh, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. By him to reconcile what? All things. Keep reading. Uh-huh. Whether they be things in heaven or earth. So there are things in earth that need to be reconciled. Keep reading. Read my mind. What am I about to say? 
There are things in heaven that need to be reconciled. Mm -hmm. And they're both done how? By the blood of Christ. Do you know what Ellen White says? It was only at the cross that some angels finally cut off all sympathy with Satan. For 4,000 years, there were angels in heaven who believed Lucifer had been unfairly treated. Mm -hmm. There needed to be reconciliation in heaven. That was accomplished by the cross of Christ. There needs to be reconciliation on earth. That was accomplished by the word, the cross of Christ. What keeps us from sin on earth also protects heaven. It's an astonishing thing that holy, sinless angels for thousands of years looked at God and wondered, did he treat this fellow right? And they're in heaven. They didn't sin, but they wondered. Wondering is not a sin. John the Baptist sent two disciples to ask Christ what? Are you the one? He had questions in prison. That's not a sin. He had questions. There were angels with questions about God. Is this right? What he did to lose? But when they saw what he did to Christ, what Christ allowed him to do, that's when they cut off the last tie of, can you imagine? Now, if sinless angels for thousands of years thought Lucifer had gotten a raw deal, what about us? It is the sacrifice of Christ that brings reconciliation of all things in heaven and on earth. And reconciliation is impossible without death. Why do I say that? Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5. Mm -hmm. Romans 5, let's read verse 10 of Romans 5. For if, Romans chapter 5, verse 10, read for me nice and clear. If you have my version, what does that say? When we were enemies, we were reconciled to how? Ah, wait a minute, pause. We're reconciled to God by the death of his son. Without death, there's no reconciliation. Because sin had to be paid for. Sin had to be paid for. Amen. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, which means he had to rise from the dead because the dead Jesus cannot save you. All this was foretold where? In the Old Testament, which is the word. Remember when Christ was going into Jerusalem and the disciples were crying out and the Pharisees told Jesus, tell them to hold their peace? What did Jesus say? If they held their peace, come on. Because the word has to be fulfilled. You say amen, but are you following me? If <laughs> the word said that would happen. Mm. And Jesus, look, if you silence them, these stones will cry out because this has to be fulfilled. Go to John 17 for me. Looking at the word of God and its power. John 17. Mm -hmm. This is Christ praying. John 17. Let's read verse 11 and verse 12. This is Christ praying now. Very beautiful chapter. I recommend it highly. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Pick up verse 12 with me now. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, finish it, but the son of perdition. Why? That the scripture might be full. Now, wait a minute. Jesus said, I saved 11, I couldn't save one. I couldn't save one. Why? Go to Psalm 41. Read verse 9. Psalm 41, read verse 9. 
This is a prophetic statement about Christ's betrayal. It was prophesied it would happen. Psalm 41 verse 9. Do you have that? Read for me nice and clear. My own familiar friend. In other words, someone close to me, you see. Hold on, hold on. Someone, we're getting clues. Someone close to me. My own familiar friend. Keep reading. In whom I trust. In whom I trust. Mm -hmm. Remember, Jesus gave Judas power to raise the dead, to heal the sick. Matthew chapter 10. My own familiar friend in whom I trusted. Keep reading. Which did eat of my bread. They fellowship together. Keep reading. Yes. Means deceive me. It was prophesied. Someone close. Now, the Bible doesn't name Judas. We choose to sin. We're never chosen to sin. We choose to sin. Let me say that clearly. God never raises up a man to sin. We choose to sin. So the Bible says someone close to Christ would betray him. Judas chose to be that person, and Jesus could not save him because Christ could not take any action that went contrary to the word. Now, who was Christ? The word. Okay, Christ is the word. Who else? Was, what else was Christ? He is. He is God. He was the creator. The creator God could not save Judas because the word said whoever did that to Christ would perish. That's the power of the word. Not even God can prevent his word from being fulfilled. Not even God. Hmm? Above his name. The Bible says, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, that if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, there shall not be room enough to receive it. Not even God can stop that. If the conditions are fulfilled, not as you want to, but I'm simply saying God cannot prevent his word from being fulfilled. That's the word of God. The Bible says the scripture cannot be broken. God has a reputation for being faithful. The reputation is based on the fact he always keeps his word. Because he cannot lie. He cannot lie is stronger than he does not lie. You didn't get it? He cannot lie. Numbers 23 and 19, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. God cannot lie. And every man a liar. And so God tells you, if you return a faithful tithe, I will bless you and you will be shocked. We don't believe it. We don't believe it. So we don't return it. God says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all. And people go through life, God didn't forgive me. I've done so much harm, he couldn't possibly forgive me. Then you're calling God a liar. Here's what we do when we don't believe, thus saith the Lord. Go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John 5, 20 minutes to 6. It's a very serious business how we interact with God's word. 1 John 5, let's read verse 10. Read with me, what does that say? He that believeth in him hath the... Read again, he that... Uh-huh, hath the... He that believeth hath made him a... Why? The record that God gave of his son. To disbelieve God is to call God, tell me, a liar. And that's a crime against divinity. You've heard of crimes against humanity? To doubt God's word is a crime against divinity. Is the crime of crimes. You know why? What do you see out that window? Trees. Who made trees? How? By the word. 
Do you see some a brightness? What's the result of that brightness? What's causing it? Who made the sun? How? Uh -huh. When you look up, there's something blue. What is that? Who made it? By his word. Who's sitting next to you? A human being. How were people made? Mm -hmm, by his word. <laughs> How were they remade? By his word. How were they made? By his word. Do you, have, do you have a horse on your farm? Do you have a cow? Do you have a sheep? How were they made? By his word. In other words, everywhere we turn, we see evidence of the power of God's word. The very snake that spoke to Eve was made how? <laughs> By the word. Are oh, you not listening? By the word. Now you're living in a world made by the word. And then you doubt God. Ah, that's a crime. Then you doubt God. Then who are you believing? This. The Bible says, train up a child. Come on. In the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart. Not he'll depart and come back. He will not leave. Amen. If he's trained how? In the way he should go. But those of us who are parents, we take that verse and we change it to say, well, people make up their own minds. <laughs> That's not what the verse says. Ellen White says, take the Bible as it reads, unless it is obviously symbolic. You train a child the way that child should be raised, that child will never leave God. The Word. We fail to follow God's Word, then we blame God. We blame God. My whole purpose this afternoon is somehow to increase your excitement about the Word of God. So that when the sun sets tonight and the holy hours are gone, you will still be interested in spending a little time in the Word of God. Don't do this and, whew, the Sabbath is gone. Still have time for this the laws that guide your body and mind, they are the Word of God. Go to Psalm 119. Beautiful Psalm, read it sometime. Psalm 119. Let's read from verse 89 to 91. Do you have Psalm 119? Reading from verse 89, let me pray first. Father, as I continue, please, Lord, replenish your spirit in my life now, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Read verse 89. What does that say? Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled where? In heaven. Now, we have heaven. Go to verse 90. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations that has established the earth, and it abideth. So we have earth in verse 90, we have heaven in verse 89. Now let me tell you something about Psalm 119. It is made up of 22 sections, each section made up of eight verses. So verse 1 to 8 is a section, and each section is named after a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. We have 22 sections. Each section is connected, but also seems to be self-contained. It has its own special message. But they all combine, elevate the Word of God, the law of God. We're starting at verse 89, a new section. So 89 says, the heaven, 90 says, earth, now. Read verse 91. They continue this day, come on, according to thy ordinance for what is they? Yes, the heaven in verse 89 and the earth in verse 90. They continue this day according to thine. Come on. Yes. Is there a different version? What do you have for ordinance in your version? Anyone has a different version beside the King James? Instead of ordinance, what do you have? No one has anything different? Commandments. Laws. 
There are laws that keep the universe running. And the laws of God are the words of God. In other words, the heavens and the earth are preserved by the word. They continue this day according to thy ordinance, for all are thy servants. Let me jump on servant. All of creation was designed to serve God's purposes. That includes us. Go to Isaiah 43, read verse 7 for me. That includes us. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Our title for this long presentation, The Point is a Person. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Do you have that? Even everyone that is called by thy name. Keep reading. For I have created him for my glory. Stop. Mm. When you understand why you were a certain place, it affects what you do. The choices you make. I have created him. Now, we live as though we were made for our glory. That's how we live. No. God put you on this earth for his glory. Keep the word glory in mind. You and I are to reflect the glory of God. Go to Psalm 19. I think that was our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 19, read verse 1. Yes, I heard someone saying it. The heavens declare, come on, the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, we read from Isaiah 43, verse 7, I have created him for my glory. And so wherever there are people, we should see the glory of God in their lives. Are you with me? The heavens declare the glory. You look up at night, there's the star, there's this, there's that, and they're all the same place at certain times. The glory of God. Go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Verse 3. You have Isaiah 6, verse 3? Read with me. And one cried unto the other and said what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Finish it for me. The whole earth is full of his... Now, we have the whole earth is full of what? We have the heavens declare what? And we were made for what? Mm -hmm. Now, how were the heavens made? Come on, quickly. How was the earth made? How do we think humans... But a word. All that glorifies God is sustained, come on, by the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Every word means you've got to be strict. We don't like the word strict. I didn't like it as a child. I'm not sure I like it now. <laughs> that is what God requires. Listen to Ellen White. Councils for the Church, page 268, paragraph 5. God's dealing with his, the history of God's dealing with his people in all ages shows that he demands exact obedience. He told Naaman, dip seven times. What would have happened had he dipped 6.9? He would have left a leper. Mm -hmm. Patriots and Prophets, page 479, paragraph 2. God shut Moses out of Canaan to teach a lesson which should never be forgotten that he requires exact obedience. And so God says, what did I say? It's simple. What did, that's what you tell your children. <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> am, I ta am I talking the truth? What did I tell you? Wap, wap, wap. If you grew up in my culture. <laughs> It really helps your righteousness. You know? <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> God the Father is no different. What did I say? Didn't I tell you? But what did he say to Adam? Didn't I tell you don't eat the fruit? <laughs> Why did you eat it? What's this? How should we live? Do you study the word? Don't answer me. Don't answer me. 
Now, your family life should be led by the Word. Your financial life should be guided by the Word. Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. Your educational life should be led by the Word. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Your romantic life should be guided by the Word. Your professional life should be guided by the Word. Ellen White tells us in uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 349, paragraph 3, religion and business are not two separate things. They are the same. In other words, in our business life, we're simply saying, here's how an Adventist Christian conducts a business. In our family life, here's how an Adventist Christian runs a family. Here's how Adventist Christians run a school. Here's how Adventist Christians date. Everything is an expression of the thus said the Lord. <clears throat> Business and religion are not two separate things. They are one. Why is that? Whether therefore you eat or drink or run a business. Finish it for me. Yes. It doesn't change. Not simply on Sabbath, seven days a week. The glory of God. You know what Jesus said? I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Because everything the Father told him to do, he did. He obeyed. In loving obedience to the Father, Christ glorified him. When those martyrs died in the Roman uh, Colosseum and the, what do you call those things? Where the animals would eat them. And, yeah, they were glorifying God. When Stephen was stoned to death, Acts 6, he was glorifying God. When Christ died on the cross, he glorified the Father. Glorifying God isn't always winning a lottery. As a matter of fact, those who will be closest to Christ in the new world will be those who died for him. Those who gave their life for him. And the power that allows us to do that is the power of God's Word. And so I appeal to you, in the name of Jesus, I call it with great respect, make time for God's Word. It will change your lives. Hmm? It really will. You know, sometimes uh, <clears throat> Ellen White says, she says, uh, open your windows and let the sun come in. Even though the sun may fade your couch, you want to fade the color? Let the sun in. Now, the sun shining on your couch doesn't fade the color overnight. It happens after several. Now, it's the same way. The Word of God shining on your heart will change, you will change as it shines consistently, you see. It will change. If you take a magnifying glass, put it up to the sun, and concentrate it on something, a fire starts. Are you following me? Have you ever done that? A fire starts. This is the power. Let it concentrate on your life. And the fire of the Holy Spirit will burn in your life. Literally burn in your life. Burn up the straw, the rubbish, the stubble. All that which makes God frown when he sees us. It'll burn it up. I want you to make a commitment. Make time for it. The scientists tell us we can retrain our taste buds. There are things you may not like, you can be trained to like them. This is true. You know, I travel all over the world. There's some things people offer me, and I, <laughs> I say, Father, this is not the time of trouble. Why am I giving this thing? <laughs> but, you know you, you know, you say, Lord, thank you. <laughs> It'll save my life, and you eat it as fast as you can. You swallow quickly. <laughs> but given time, you can learn to like that thing. Are you with me? There's a fruit, I hope no one from Indonesia is listening to me. There's a fruit in Indonesia called durian. <laughs> also the Philippines, I think, Malaysia. So my friends from Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, watching this sermon, please don't stop loving me. <laughs> yes, the scientists say our taste buds can be retrained, but I think there's an exception when it comes to durian. <laughs> no amount of time can change my <laughs> taste buds to like that fruit. Anyway, 
The same thing happens spiritually. Our taste buds can be retrained to go from ESPN to 3ABN. Mm -hmm. It can be retrained to go from you know, TBS to Hope Channel. From Sports Illustrated to Corinthians. Are you following me? It can be retrained by just exposing the mind to the Word of God for a sustained period of time. Maybe three weeks, ten minutes a day, you will be surprised how your likes and your appetites will start to change. Mm -hmm. Then you realize, I never knew the Bible was such a sweet book. And then you throw away the Harry Potter novels. Are you following me? And you come here. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, says Jeremiah. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job 23, 12. Jesus told the disciples when they brought him food, when the woman at the well went off to her village to do whatever she had to do. The disciple says, Master, eat! Because he was hungry. He said, I have meat to eat ye know not of. How sweet are thy words unto me, my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The word of how many of you will say, Father, help me to make time in my day, every day, for your word. Can I see your hand? Let me recommend a book to you, the book of John. And I'll close on this. Go to John 20. Let me show you why I recommend John. John 20. We read the last two verses of John 20. Here's why I recommend this book, John 20, three minutes to six. Do you have John? Let me pray one more time. Father, I'm coming to a close with these remarks I believe you've given me. In lightness, I pray, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Read verse 30 of John 20, and many other signs, truly, did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written where? Now stop. What does that say to you? Look at the verse again carefully. Always read microscopically. Look carefully at the verse and tell me what you see. Say that again. Everything Christ did was not written down. All right, what else do you see? Notice, and many other signs truly did Jesus where? In the presence of his... What does that mean to you? While he was here, yes. What else? John was a what? He was an eyewitness. He saw... And the other disciples could back him up. They all saw the same thing. In the presence, not just of John, of his disciples. John said, I, the other... We saw him. Many. Now, the Gospel of John is regarded as only recording eight miracles, eight, before Christ died. After he rose, he, he provided, you know, he, he told them they were fishing, found nothing. Then he got some fish, and that was a miracle too. But usually, it's recorded as having eight miracles before Christ died. John. Just eight. But he said he saw many now, which are not written in this book. But did Christ ever do anything bad? Yes or no? So everything John saw was good. Mm -hmm. Keep this in mind now. But of all the good things you see, he only chose what's written in the book. What do we call that? The creme de la? Mm -hmm. Put that in English. The cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. He picked those now. Now. Why? Read verse 31. Nice and loud. But these are, what do you mean by these? What's in the book? Why? Uh-huh. Keep reading. Is the son of the? And? You might have? Through his? Yes. Yes. John said, look, you study this. Eternal life. <laughs> because I carefully selected from all that I saw Christ do, I selected with a purpose in mind, your salvation. Amen. From the miracle of turning water to wine in Cana, chapter 2, to the very last miracle recorded, John said, all of this is designed to lead you to believe in Jesus. 
that you may have life. John's gospel. Mm -hmm. And if that gospel can't change your life, I don't know which Bible book can. Now, you're also reading a book written by the man who was closest to Christ. I said that this morning or earlier this afternoon. Closest to Christ. This is an inside view of Jesus. This is from the bosom of Jesus. That's where John was leaning. This is an inside look. That Christ was a real man, by the way. No wonder that of the 11 disciples, Judas went his way, of course. 60 years later, Jesus appeared to whom? John. And gave him what? Revelation, yes. Can you imagine what went through John's heart when he heard that voice? He was about 90 years old then. He lived the longest of the 12. He was the youngest, he lived the longest. He heard that voice, recognizing his old friend, his master. When he turned, he saw it, he just collapsed. Jesus had to touch him and raise him. He just collapsed. Have you ever seen animals when someone comes back from the army from something, you're on YouTube, the dogs just jump and they go nuts because this John just collapsed. <laughs> Could not believe. That's Jesus, the risen Savior. Ah, what a beautiful picture. See his old friend. Why do I say friend? Jesus says, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Who does not want God for a friend? What's the condition? Obey my word. Ye are my friends if, finish it, ye do whatsoever I command you. John turned and saw his friend. Ah. I can only imagine what went through his heart. And then the friend spoke to him, gave him seven letters, showed him visions, all sorts of things. And ah, John wrote that book. Then later on, he was released from Patmos, went to Asia Minor, where he finally died. Read the Gospel of John. If you want to start memorizing, start with the Gospel of John. All right, let me ask you now, what have you learned? Or what has been Strengthened that you already knew. Raise your hand. Tell us. What have you learned? What opened your eyes? What was a blessing to you? Yes, my dear brother. You said that the angels that were cast out wondered about God. Mm -hmm. That was eye opening. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. If I said this to someone, how can I back that up? How can you? Well, you, you go to, let's go to Colossians 1. You see, when studying the Bible, you have to reason. You have to reason. Look at Colossians 1. And let's go to John 12 and Colossians 1. John 12, Colossians 1. Read Colossians 1, verse 20. We read that earlier, then we'll go to John 12. Read Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verse 20. Read for us. What does that say? And have we made peace through the blood of his Christ by him to reconcile or to himself, I say, whether things in or things in. So we know clearly reconciliation was needed in heaven. Now, there's no difference between Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's not where the reconciliation is needed. It has to be with God's created beings who don't know everything, who don't understand everything. The Father understands everything, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay, we need reconciliation. Now, let's go to John 12. That's one clue. John 12. Let's read from verse 27 of John 12. Do you have that? What does that say? Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Keep reading. Then came there a voice from heaven saying what? I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Keep reading. The people that stood by and heard it said, It thundered. Others said, An angel speak to him. What did Jesus say? This voice came not, but for your 
Now, read carefully, go on. Now is the... Start again. Now is the what? Judgment of this world. Now shall the... Be... Ah. Now, our next verse. And I, if I be... What does he mean by lifted up? On the cross. Now he said, now is the judgment of this earth. Now shall the prince of this earth be what? Ah, oh, wait a minute. Revelation 12, 9. Read that for me. Revelation 12, 9. Mm -hmm. Revelation 12, 9. Do you have that? Let's read from 7 of Revelation 12. Read from verse 7. Are you there? You should know this without looking. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was the place found anymore in heaven. Now listen to verse 19. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is a past event. But Jesus says, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. In other words, something is about to happen. Satan is about to be cast out again. But what is the second casting out? Go to Job 1. Go to Job 1. Let's read from verse 6. Job 1, reading from verse 6. Are you there? Read with me. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, why did Satan... Well, let's keep reading. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From doing what? To and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now, that statement simply means I'm acting as though it's mine, which it was in a certain legal sense it was. Because when Adam sinned, it turned over to Satan. Mm -hmm. Christ had to die to get it back legally. Are you with me? Christ legally, it fell to, to, to Satan. That's why L.O.I. tells us in uh, Steps to Christ, page 17, I believe, paragraph 1, fallen man is Satan's lawful captive. Legal captive. By the death of Christ, it becomes legally Christ now. Okay, so he said by going to and forth in the earth and walking up and down in it. I represent the earth. So now look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of Job. Are you there? What's the first word? Again, what does that tell you? Say that again. What? Yes. The evidence suggests these meetings were held regularly. And Satan would go to represent, come on, the earth. Mm -hmm. Jesus called him the prince. Paul called him the god of this earth. Because when Adam fell, he took over. God's world. He would go. But Christ was about to die, you see. So Christ said in John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this earth. Now shall the prince of this earth be cast out. Not only from heaven, he could no longer go back to uh, represent earth. Now the second Adam, by his death, will take over. Are you following me? So he was not only from heaven, but from the affections of the angels. So this is the evidence that up until that point, the fact that Lucifer could go back, and, Satan could go back and forth in some way and be part of that meeting tells us that there, were, there was some, must have been some feeling of sympathy for him. When Christ died, that ceased, he was cast out. Go to Revelation 12. Let's read verse, let's read 9 again, then we go to verse 10. 9 and 10, Revelation 12. Are you there? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, read verse 10 carefully. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and, and the for the uh, Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is, yet yeah, which accuse him before our God. Aha. Uh -huh. This is a reference again to the fact that at the death of Christ, Satan was cast out. Because one of his functions is to accuse. 
Remember, go to Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, let's read from verse 1. Are you there? Zechariah 3 from verse 1. You haven't found Find Malachi, work your way back. You get Zechariah. You have Zechariah 3, verse 1. Yes, <clears throat> I'm waiting for God's lovely people to find it. Have you found it yet? Not yet. I'll wait. The sun hasn't set yet. I'll wait. Zechariah chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Do we have that? All right, we can. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, this is a vision that God gives Zechariah of Joshua represents the Israelites in heaven. Here's Joshua, the Israelites. Here's Satan right next to him to resist him, oppose him. Then, of course, we have take away the filthy garments. This, of course, vision is long before Christ died. That vision could no longer apply after Christ died because Satan could no longer go up there. So the evidence I'm suggesting is that based on the death of Jesus Christ, Satan had no longer any connection, any freedom to go back to heaven. He lost that and must have lost also. Go to 1 Peter 1. Let me show you. 1 Peter 1? Um, no. Yes, 1 Peter 1. No, 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. Read verse uh, 10, from 10. What does that say? Say it again. I can't hear what you're saying. Second, P Second Peter chapter 1, read verse 9. No, first Peter, first Peter 1, verse 9. Where is First Peter 1, verse 9? Say it again. The receiving the end of your faith, come on, even the salvation. Okay, that's First Peter 1, 9. Read verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace which shall come unto you. Searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them is signified when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now read verse 12 carefully. Unto whom it was revealed. That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that has preached the gospel unto you. Finish the verse. With the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to want? Yes. You see, that angels don't fully understand the plan of salvation. So when God told Moses to build the ark, there was a mercy seat. What was on either side of the mercy seat? An angel. Now, how were their faces oriented? Go to Exodus 25 quickly. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, let's read from verse 19. We read 19 and 20 of Exodus 25. I'm just giving some biblical evidence that might support what my brother asked about the final cutting off of sympathy with Satan. Exodus 25, let's read from verse 19. What does that say? And make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherubim on the other end. Even of the... Keep reading, shall you make... The cherubims, read 20, and the cherubim shall stretch forth the wings on high, what? Covering the mercy seat with their, keep reading, and their faces shall look one, uh-huh, ah, now, read carefully, their faces shall look what? One, now the next verse says, even toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. In other words, they are like this but not looking at each other. They're looking down. But they're like this, you see, one, but looking down. What are they looking at? The relationship between what's on the top of the ark? What's in the ark? What's in the ark? What are they trying to understand? How justice and mercy work. How can a sinless God 
forgive sinners without disrespecting his law. The gospel solves that. And so we see angels trying to figure out. Are you, are you with me? How this works? Now, go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. We read 9 and 10. You read verse 9. What does that say? And make all men see what is the which from the have been hidden who created all things by verse 10 to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where in heavenly places might be known come on by the church the manifold now it is as the angels watch how salvation works in the church the saved that they begin to understand listen again to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where? In heaven. Now, who are they? Angels, unfallen worlds, principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known. What? The manifold wisdom of God. As they see salvation working in the church, they begin to understand. Angels. How grace, mercy, and justice work because they do not understand everything. So we have clear biblical evidence. Angels, they learn. Now, let me say quickly, they are infinitely wiser than we are. Are you with me? But salvation is the greatest mystery in the universe. That's why we'll study it for how long? An eternity. So they also try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And when Christ died, Satan could no longer go back to represent the earth. Amen. The second Adam took over, he was thrown out of heaven, couldn't go out of the affections, the sympathy, that ceased. When Christ died. All right. Someone, okay. Someone else. What did you learn? What were you reminded of? What blessed you? Yes, my good brother. By bread alone? Then I realized that what by every word. Eh, not some, every word. And condense every commandment. Because the commandments are life. They are life. Christ gives life, but the life he gives is in the Ten Commandments. The law of God is life. Romans chapter 7, verse 10, the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Why? Because when you disobey it, the penalty is death. But the purpose of a commandment is the preservation of life. In the day thou eatest thereof, come on. In the day thou obeyest, come on. Mm -hmm. It's even simpler than ABC. What else did you hear today that maybe touched you or blessed you? Come on, tell us. Yes, my brother? Oh, no, you're operating the camera, sorry. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Okay. When the Bible, yes. When we don't have the Bible yes. anymore, uh -huh. uh, the commandment mm -hmm. was to be in our hearts. This should be in our hearts, yes. Yes. Thank you for saying that. Elamite advises us, memorize as much as you can, because the day will come when you will not have a Bible. And, um, but the law of God should be written here. You can go through immigration with the law here, and you can't be stopped. Are you following me? You hold one of these in your hand, you can be stopped. Make sure it is here. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I might not say yes. Put it here. Put it here. Yes. Somebody else. Oh, but I wanted to say, notice it is God who writes the law on the heart, not you. You cannot write the law in your heart because it's a divine thing. Elway said the law of God is as sacred as God himself. How can I write it? It's the spirit. Go to 2 Corinthians 3. Let the Bible talk to you. 2 Corinthians 3. Let's read verse 3. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3. 20 after 6. When is the sunset? Okay. We have two more hours of fellowship. Can you say Amen. amen. 
Well, that didn't come from the heart, but it's okay. What, uh, what book did I say? Second Corinthians chapter 3. Let's read verse 3. And when you read, read clearly so I can understand what you're saying. Don't just mumble. Read clearly. You're reading the Word of God, not Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay. Do you have 2 Corinthians 3 verse 3? Read for me. What does that say? King James Version. That's declared to be the epistle of Christ. Come on. Ministered by us. Written. But. Yes. Not in tables of. But in fleshy tables of the. Wait a minute. That language takes you back where? Sinai. Mm -hmm. The law was given and the law was? Yes. Now read the verse again. Keep Sinai in mind. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Stop. The law of God is written by the Spirit. Not in flesh, not in tables of stone, as at Sinai, but in fleshy tables of the heart. So we're, we're taken back to Sinai. At Sinai, the law was written where? On stone. Paul says God wants to write them where? Yes. But who did the writing? According to 2 Corinthians 3, who writes them in our hearts? The Holy Spirit. But then who wrote them at, Calv at Sinai? <laughs> okay. Let's solve that problem, then we can go home. Go to Exodus 31. <laughs> go to Exodus 31. Now, you can't have a hard time finding Exodus. It's just book number two. Do you have it? Exodus 31. Ooh. Do you have that? Let's read verse 18 of Exodus 31. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, what? Two tables of, tables of, written with the finger of, yes, now we have tables of stone testimony written with the finger of God. How many members of the Godhead are they? Three. Who spoke the Ten Commandments from Sinai? Quickly. Jesus. It was Christ. Because Christ is the mediator between God and men. A mediator means you can't talk directly to that side. You've got to go through me. Are you with me? The instant Adam sinned, Christ became mediator. And so it was Christ who spoke the law. But he spoke it for the Father. Are you with me? No, you're not. Are you with me? Christ spoke the law for the Father. Christ created for the Father. So Christ spoke the law at the Father's request. Those are two members of the Godhead. Then who wrote it? Well, let's see if we can get him involved in this family affair. Are you with me? Yes. Let us go to, <laughs> let's go to Matthew 28. Not Matthew 28, Matthew 12. Let's read verse 28 of Matthew 12. Who wrote the Ten Commandments back then? And who writes them now on our hearts? Matthew 12, verse 28, this is Jesus speaking. Have you found Matthew 12, first gospel, first book of the New Testament? How many books in the New Testament? How many in the Old? How many total? That's right. How many did a woman write? None. <laughs> Why do you look at me like that? <laughs> Esther was not written by Esther. <laughs> I don't rebel and start a riot. Okay, maybe I shouldn't have asked you that. Okay, where are we now? What book? Matthew 12, verse 28. Read for me. And if I? Uh-huh, by the? Uh-huh, no doubt. It's come unto you. Now, Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit, because he was accused of casting out devils by Beelzebub, in verse, I think it's 24. So Jesus said, wait a minute. If I cast out spirits by the devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. Now, go to Luke 11. Luke 11. Two books from Matthew. Luke was a medical doctor. He was not one of the 12 disciples. He was the only non-Jew to write the book of the Bible. Luke was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. 
He also traveled with Paul. He wrote two books of the Bible, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. He was a historian and a medical doctor. Luke 11, verse 20, Luke is writing the same thing, but here's what he says. Verse 20, read for me. But if I... Let's start again, start again, clearly. But if I... With the finger of God, come on. Then no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Luke says, the finger of God. What does Matthew say? The Spirit of God. What's the connection? The Holy Spirit is the finger of God. Go to Exodus 8. Exodus 8. Remember how the plagues began to fall on Egypt? I believe this is plague number 3. Let's read verse 19. Here's what the magicians tell Pharaoh. Exodus 8, 19, what does that say? And the magicians did so with their... Yes. They couldn't reproduce that miracle. They said, this power is the finger of God. And the finger of God is the Spirit of God. God the Father commanded the law to be spoken. Jesus spoke it. The Holy Spirit wrote it. The entire family of heaven involved in the giving of the law. Amen. Now, when you keep this in mind, you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, read verse 3, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. The Spirit that writes it here is the same one that wrote it on the law, on the stone. But let me say this quickly. Even back then, God wanted it written here. But the Israelites had been so Egyptianized. Hmm? that they, they never realized a need for divine power. That's why they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we'll do. And God said, really? <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. These are the people who told Moses, uh, who is he? Moses said, give me a name. Because they don't know you. <laughs> Ellen White said they had gone so far, very few of them remembered the Sabbath or remembered God. They had gone so far. Yet they said, whatever God says, we, we've got this. And they had to learn very quickly, you know, no, no, you can't do this by yourself. You need a savior. And so the law commanded by the Father, spoken by the Son, written by the Holy Spirit. When you receive the law of God, you receive the heavenly family. And there were angels all over, all over that mountain. I asked you earlier, make a commitment to find time for God's word every day. I'll tell you something else. Fall asleep thinking of God's word. Mm -hmm. Ella White writes, Our High Calling, page 116, paragraph 2. Listen carefully. Beautiful expression, very short. Our High Calling, Page 116, paragraph 2. Your last thought at night, your first thought in the morning, should be of him in whom is centered your hope of eternal life. Who is that? Jesus Christ. Ellen White said your last thought should be of Christ. And the way to do that is to fall asleep thinking about this. What I try to do is fall asleep reciting Bible passages. I'm not offering myself as an example of anything. I'm simply saying, I try to fall asleep reciting because the, Satan does not sleep. He and his demons attack people at night. When you're sleeping, you're unconscious. But the word of God, unconsciousness is a form of death. Are you following me? It's a form of death. You don't know what's going on. But the word of God never sleeps. Are you with me? God doesn't slumber nor sleep. And so the unsleeping word of God has to protect the mind of the sleeping saint who does not know what's happening, but he's covered by the word of God. Surround your mind with the word of God every night before you sleep. 
Let me tell you the story, then I'll close. I may have told you last time I was here, I don't remember. This young lady came to me a few years ago. She said, I cannot sleep at night. Demons come, they trouble me, they sexually assault me. That's what she told me. I said to her, you need the word of God. First, confess all your sins. Deny the devil. Because all problems are rooted in sin. Whether sins you and I commit or just living in a sinful world, all problems are the result of sin. Confess all known sins. Then take the word of God. And I gave her 1 John 3 verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. I told her, take that verse and ask God, destroy what the devil is doing in my life at night. Destroy it. I told her, fall asleep calling on that verse. She came to me the next day at that crusade. She said, I slept for the first time in months. Because the devil cannot get past thus saith the Lord. I keep saying, let me finish, but let me say this. <laughs> what time is sunset? <laughs> Go back to Psalm 148 quickly. The Spirit just brought that to me. I think it's the Spirit. Psalm 148 verses 1, 2, and 3. Now, I want you to reason with me. Psalm 148 verses 1, 2, and 3. I think I told you that's a lovely psalm. Learn it. Study it. Are you ready? Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise ye him. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his. Praise ye him all his. Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were. Now, let's go back to verse 2. The angels. We know from verse 2 and 5, the angels were made by the word of God. He commanded. Now, name two angels that you know by name. Gabriel and? Come on. Lucifer who became? Satan. Two angels. How was Lucifer made? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, listen to me carefully. If the word made Lucifer... Which is greater, the word or Lucifer? The word. Lucifer became Satan, but he's still an angel. The word of God is more powerful than angels because the word made them. And so this is more powerful than Satan. Go to Matthew 8 quickly. Let me see who's the first person to find Matthew 8. Anyone on my left side? No, not yet. <clears throat> my right side? No. A church full of slow people. Okay. Do you have it now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's read verse 16 of Matthew 8. Read microscopically. What does that say? And when the even was come, they brought unto him many that all that were possessed with devils. Carefully now. And he cast out the spirits. How? What is word? Yes. The spirits mean the demons. He cast them out with his word. If the word cast them out, which is more powerful, them or the word? The word. How did Jesus resist Satan? By the word. This is what terrifies the devil. There's something in my mind I don't think I should tell you. You're too young. You couldn't handle it. I shouldn't. Uh, should I tell you? <laughs> huh? You look so innocent. I don't know if you tell you. All right, let me try. When, I want you to show you the power of God's word. What did God tell Adam? In the day thou eatest thereof. That's what the word said. Now, question for you. When Adam sinned, was he a vegetarian? Yes. He was a vegetarian. Who didn't follow what? Come on. Who didn't follow what? The word. The word. Now, am I condemning vegetarianism? No. I'm simply saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every... Mm-hmm. What was the topic I gave to this presentation? The point is, a person. You are saved... By Christ, who's the Word. No one followed forms more strictly than the Pharisees. 
And no one shouted more loudly, crucify him. I want to finish, but something else just came to me. <laughs> go, to, go to Isaiah 1, <laughs> quickly. Go to Isaiah 1. I'll stop when the young people tell me they're tired. Then I'll stop. If they don't tell me they're tired, I'll keep going. Go to Isaiah 1 with me quickly, please. <laughs> Isaiah 1. Do you have that, Isaiah 1? I want to show you something. It's a problem we have. The Jews had the same problem. Let's read from verse 11 of Isaiah 1. To what purpose, come on, is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord. Now, pause. What do you understand by sacrifices? The whole sacrificial system. Now, who gave humanity the sacrificial system? Christ. Mm -hmm. He taught it to Adam in Eden. Mm -hmm. The same Christ, speaking through Isaiah, says, to what purpose? is the multitude of your sacrifices. Why do you bring all this stuff? But he asked for it. Keep reading, I am full of the what? Burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bulls or of he lambs or of he God, I am sick to death of all these dead animals you bring me. But he said, bring them. Verse 12, bring no more vain, or what's an oblation? It's a liquid offering. Water, whatever. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is what? And now, you know what incense represents in the Bible? The righteousness of Christ. He said, incense is an abomination unto me. You know, the new moons, the new, your appointed feasts. Um, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is not an abomination. The new moons and the appointed feasts, you know, my, my soul, I, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul... I hate it. They're troubling to me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. He said, look, don't bring all that stuff. But he's the one who asked for it. Here's the problem. The Jews or the Israelites had come to the place where they placed their hopes on those animals. Not on Christ. Are you following me? They thought by following forms, they could save themselves. Jesus, look, <laughs> you're missing the point. The point is not a goat or a sheep or a dish. The point is a person. Who's that person? That's me. You're missing me. The point for all of this is me. Go to Luke 18. Let's read from verse 9. Luke 18 from verse 9. Hmm? Luke 18, verse 9. You're all familiar with the two men who went up into the temple to pray. Do you have Luke 18, verse 9? Read for me. What does that say? And he, this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised. Notice the word in, they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That's not a condemnation of genuine righteousness. It is what is the source? Is it what you do or is it Christ? They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now we will get an example of trusting in yourself. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, the other a publican. Now, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Read with me now. God, I thank thee, I am not as other men are. Go on. Extortioners, unjust, or even as this publican. Now, here is trusted in themselves. Keep reading. I fast twice in a week. I return tithe. That's trusting in themselves. I do these things, therefore I'm righteous. You know what could be added to that list? What could we add today to that list? I? Come on. I? Drink distilled water. Hmm? I? Come on. I eat all vegetables. Come on. I wear long dresses. Come on. Uh, 
I'm righteous. <laughs> That's a Pharisee. Because I do these things, I'm righteous. This guy, what's he doing in church? Jesus said, that guy went down to his house, come on, justified. And a Pharisee who had a list, a resume of all his good works, he went the same condition. Now, what am I saying? Let me quickly say, when you come to Christ, should you eat a certain way? Yes. Should you dress a certain way? Yes. Should you talk a certain way? Yes. But who is your righteousness? Jesus. And when you miss that, you miss the whole point. Listen to Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that when I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and he shall execute judgment and justice. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called. Who can finish the verse? The Lord, our righteousness. Never forget, your righteousness is Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians 1, read verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. We must place our confidence in Christ. But of course, when Christ dwells in you, everything changes about you. Everything changes. Your dress, your eating, your everything changes. But it is Christ. Do you have 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30? Read for me. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and Yes, he is all these things. Christ is wisdom. Christ is redemption. Christ is sanctification. Christ is righteousness. There's no such thing as a righteous vegetable. But should you eat them? Yes. You don't go to the store and buy a, a bottle of righteous, you know, spring water. There's no unrighteous Coke. Are you following me? Or righteous orange juice. The righteousness is, come on, tell me, Christ. But when Christ is in you, you change what you drink. Come on, say amen. You change how you dress. You change how you spend your money because the righteousness of Christ is directing your life. And so Ella White writes in Christ's Object Lessons, page 215, paragraph 2. The Israelites had misrepresented God among the nations. They were not merely useless, but a decided hindrance. To a large degree, their religion was misleading and wrought ruin instead of uh, salvation. They focus on all the forms and ceremonies. So when Christ came, they didn't know. <laughs> Are you with me? They focused on the forms and the ceremonies and the dead animals. They did not know Christ came. But very faithfully killing animals. Squeezing out all the blood. I had no clue that Christ came. When I lift up the word, I'm lifting up Jesus Christ. Are you with me? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Without me, you can do nothing. I'm asking you, pursue a knowledge of Christ. It will change you profoundly. And if you're close to him now, you'll be drawn even closer. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And to know Christ is to love him. And the only way to love Christ is to obey him. And that obedience must be seen in how we live, how we dress, how we eat, how we spend our money, how we date, how we educate our children. But we're never forgetting that it is all Jesus. Amen. You see, if you drink alcohol, you become drunk. Are you with me? You don't say, well, my hand is drunk. No, you're drunk. Are you following me? It's not my foot is drunk. You're drunk. 
So when you take the alcohol of Jesus now, which makes you walk straight, then it is Jesus in you. It is Jesus in you. That's why you eat the way you eat. I eat a vegetarian diet because Jesus tells me to. I dress in a certain way because Jesus wants me to. I conduct my romantic life a certain way because Jesus wants me to. So that Christ becomes the motive. You don't follow vegetarian diet to be healthy. You follow vegetarian diet because God said so. Now, the byproduct is health, don't misunderstand me, but because he said so. Mm. Because he said so. I keep the Sabbath because he said so. And always remember, because God is God, he will ask us to do some things that make no sense. No sense. But we'll do it because he said so. Do you love Jesus? Can I see your hand? You love him? He's a nice person. I love Jesus a lot. Very nice person. I look forward to seeing him if I'm faithful. I don't want to miss seeing Christ. I just, I don't want to miss him. You can't miss the pleasures of this world and then miss heaven too. It makes no sense. So if you're going to miss this world, make up your mind to beware with Christ when he comes. And the only person who can stop you is you. You see, when you hold to that cross, not even God can pull you off. You didn't hear what I said. When you grab that cross of Calvary, God can't pull you off. Mm -mm. He can't pull you off. And so cling to Christ. Cling to Christ. And you cling to Christ by clinging to his word, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's stand for prayer. Ten minutes to seven. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Before I pray, any prayer requests? Any prayer requests? Yes, my sister. Your son. How old is he? A grown man. A grown, okay. Spiritual problems? All right. Okay. Did I see your hand? I want the finances multiplied. You want what? Finances multiplied. Okay. Finances, finances, yes. The silver and gold is mine, saith the Lord. Haggai 2, verse 8. Yes, my brother. My grandson. Your grandson, yes. Isaiah 49, 25. I will save thy children. Some, yes. My son. My son. Oh, your son. Okay, okay. Yeah, there's your hand. Courage. Courage? Okay. Fear thou not, for I'm with thee. Yes. Your back, yes, brother Randy. I've been praying for that. Yes, yes, yes. God made the back. He can fix it. Mm -hmm. Yes, my brother. Wisdom and discernment, yes. We read in 1 Corinthians 1.31, Christ is our wisdom. Discernment is a gift of the church. The Holy Spirit brings that discernment, but that discernment comes through this. Somebody else, prayer request. Yes, sister. Huh? Your health, yes. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, yes. A family evangelistic ministry. What's it called? That's the Thomas family. Okay, the Thomas. Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, let's... Yes, sister. To more people to come and hear the word of God, no matter who preaches it. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sister. Yes, take, yes. Let a carnal nature die. Die in the sense that it no longer has any power to really. You, you're so given to Christ. Its rule in your life is dead. And when he comes, then it's removed completely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to know what? The will of God for you. It's right in here. Of course, there's a very straight statement about the will of God. 1 Thessalonians verse four, verse, chapter 4, verse 3. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification, which means get sin out of your life. That's number one. As sin goes, blessings come. But blessings and sin can't occupy the same space. As sin goes, blessings come. Mm -hmm. So the will of God begins with, let's deal with sin. Let's deal with that. And then watch the blessings flush.
I mean flourish and flower and bloom. Somebody else, prayer request. Then I pray. Okay, if it does, not too much of a problem, kneel as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much, dear God, for this holy day and the blessings that have come through worship, singing, giving, and the word. We thank you for your people and their love for you. Father, we thank you so much for Psalm 103, verse 14. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we're dust. And dust sometimes falls. Dust panics. Dust cries. Dust grows weak in faith sometimes. You remember we're dust, dear God. And so we ask you, strengthen this dust. Pick us up, Father. Forgive us for our weakness. But verse 13 says, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pity of them that fear him. We love you, Father, but we fall. Wrap your arms around us. Lift us up, Father, and whisper in our ear, walk with me again, my son. Walk with me, my daughter. I have not forsaken you. If I said anything I should not have said, forgive me, Father. And I ask you that you will take the words as they please you and apply them with greater force to those who heard. Remember the prayer request, dear God. Several for family members, for health, for finances, for courage, for strength, for the conquest of the carnal nature. Every request I heard, Father, is exactly your will for that person. And I ask you now, you for whom nothing is impossible, move in their lives, dear God. Please. Remind us of how powerful you are, Father. Do something for us. Give us the health we need. Remove the aches and pains, dear God. Provide the finances we need. Wrap your arms around our children. Bring them back to the foot of the cross. Strengthen our family ministries. Strengthen our families. Bless everyone who came today. Let us leave this building renewed in the confidence that we serve a God who tells us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Dear God, let us in our lives bring glory to your name. Let us in our lives lead people to Christ. Watch over us tonight. Put a double blessing on our children. Let us sleep under the protection of your eternal word. And if you open our eyes tomorrow, let us go forward to glorify your name by living a life of joyful obedience. Bless the leadership of this church, the past and all the leaders, dear God, and all churches represented by those listening. Thank you, Father, for the honor of speaking for you and for the sweet delight of fellowshipping with your saints in this building. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of the holy hours.